I'm Bridget Bardot, for all you know, your girl behind the counter, and a couple of videos ago, um, a wonderful subscriber of ours called Drunk That I'm Not um, asked me what my Halloween faves were, and unfortunately at the time, I had, like, way too much of, like, a line of stuff that I needed to do, like, I had, like, a bajillion collaborations and stuff, so I'm doing this video very late. Uh, but I have brought out my lovely, like, first stole, so I've, I've brought out all the bells and whistles to go and tell you my Halloween faves. Um, so without further ado, uh, Bridget's Halloween faves. Pew, pew, uh, confetti everywhere. <laughs> um, alright, so we're starting with some trash at first. Uh, Frankenhooker by Frank Henenlotter. And... I'm sure with a title like Frankenhooker, you're like, what is this movie about? Well, uh, Jeffrey Stein, uh, no relation to Dr. Frankenstein, I assure you, um, his girlfriend was in a freak lawnmower accident and uh, went kablooey everywhere. Um, and since he's so desperate to have her back because he loves her and appreciates her, but also sees her as a body, um, he uses the bodies of, well, blown up hookers, dead hookers, to try to, to try to remake her, make her better, stronger, like the bionic woman. <laughs> um, so he uses all these dead hookers to make a new woman and a new body for his girlfriend to inhabit. How well this goes, I cannot say. You're going to have to watch the movie. So if I was to really go and sum up this movie, I would say if you can't get through the premise, you're not going to get through this film. It's very much a dead dub do not eat film. Um, the term dead dub do not eat comes from fan fiction, and it very much refers to a, well, it originally comes from Arrested Development, but it very much became a fan fiction term. And it refers to a fan fiction where the bad stuff is, like, in the title and, like, in the description. Like, if you can't handle it, you're not gonna go forward with this. So, if you cannot handle the premise to Frankenhooker, you're not gonna get through Frankenhooker. It's very much what it's like on the tin. But if you can get through the premise, uh, you're in for a wild ride. Because Frankenhooker is gory fantastic, um, incredibly, like, visually out there, and honest to God has one of the best performances from Patty Mullen I have ever seen, and her, hey, want a date, is endlessly quotable, and you can do it all day, and if you can get your mouth to do the same thing that Patty Mullen does, like, bravo, applause to you. Um, but Frankenhooker's fantastic, it's endlessly quotable, it's endlessly gory, and if you're looking for a fun B-movie to watch after Halloween, I would highly suggest this one, because it's everything a B-movie does right. So we're going to start with something a little bit classier with uh, Dracula by Todd Browning. So I will admit that I am a little biased, mostly because I grew up with Dracula as a kid, and he was very much my favorite, and is still my favorite, Universal Monster. Um, and also this movie may have started my eternal love for Bela Lugosi and my eternal crush on Bela Lugosi, so uh, I really hope he's not a problematic fave. Anyways, what is Dracula about? Dracula is about Count Dracula and his BFF slash possible boyfriend, Renfield. I just gotta say, Dracula's a bisexual icon. Read the books. He definitely has a crush on Jonathan Harker. <laughs> I'm way too deep into this Dracula hole already. Um, but bisexual icon Dracula and his uh, possible BFF slash boyfriend Renfield. Uh, just kidding. It's, he wants Jonathan to be his boyfriend. Um, but he goes to London, and he wreaks some havoc, he buys some real estate, he meets a cute girl, he maybe decides he wants to get into a polyamorous thing with them, and we'll see how this goes down in the end of Dracula. Um, so what do I like about Dracula? 
Um, I like the fact that it has some serious, like, goth vibes while, like, being very close to, like, the Victorian kind of goth era. Just kidding. That's not how history works. I swear to God, I did get a better score in history than most people probably think I did based on that comment. But, um, for being actually one of the first horror movies, it actually holds up fairly well and has some serious like goth vibes about it uh probably due to its fantastic lighting fantastic set design and to be quite honest like a lot of really cool like small like anachronisms like if you haven't seen the armadillos in the bee coffins they're fun to see on rewatch um, but finally, it just has some really great performances from, like, Bella Lugosi and from everyone else in the cast, mostly because they had some time to go and look over their roles after their time in the stage play. This was originally a stage play, by the way. Um, and honest to God, it just holds up really well and holds up really well for kids. I think it's a great first horror movie. It's... Bridget approved. And also, if they get a certain thirst for Dracula afterwards, that's not my fault. That's just the incredible, desirable drive of Bella Lugosi, which he has through the grave. I can't help that. Anyways, moving on to some weird shit. Alright, so I told everyone we were about to get weird. It's time for Halsu by Nobuhiko Obayashi. And I, I totally came in like a wrecking ball and just destroyed that man's name. I'm real sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm bad at names. Anyways, let's see how I mess up more names. Uh, so what is Haosu about? Haosu is about seven stereotypes named... Let's see if I get it right on, right on this take. Who knows? Jesus take the wheel with this. Who? Okay, so we've got Melody, Fantasy, Mac... Gorgeous, kung fu, sweet, and gorgeous. No. Your, did I already say gorgeous? Prof, professor, I did it. I did it. Woo! I did it. This was like 10 takes. This was like 10 different takes. I'm really terrible at memorizing names. And these names are very hard to memorize. Anyways, putting on the jacket again. Um, so these seven stereotypes get to go to Gorgeous's aunt's house where uh, some spooky stuff happens. Uh, spooky, spooky, weird stuff. Um, so this, this film's got a reputation for being one of the strangest horror films, and uh, it may have been dethroned with one of my honorable mentions, but I will give, I will give it that it's incredibly strange. Um, so a lot of people have probably already seen this one, but if you haven't, um, be aware that you're in for some incredible color, some gorgeous visuals, some fantastic lighting, and some of the most creative kills I have ever seen. And finally, it's just a movie that has a really easy plot to remember, and you're not going to be looking at like a ton of subtitles. And you're not going to be very overblown and like bogged down with plot. Um, so if you're interested in something with some great visuals and not a ton of plot, plot, Haosu's the way to go. But if you're interested in doing a fantastic watch party, anyone who hasn't seen Haosu is great to subject Haosu to. Because everyone's got a reaction to it. All right, so I should let everybody know in advance that I... Do not like anthology series. I have tried to really get into them, and I find that a lot of them have, like, one story that I like, but, like, the rest of them just don't hold up. A really great example of that for me was VHS. I saw the first, uh, I saw the first short in VHS, and it scared me, like, so much, but I just found the rest of them didn't really hold up very well. That being said, let's talk about the one anthology series that does hold up, Creepshow 1 and 2. Created by George A. Romero and Stephen King, absolute horror icons. Um, 
Creepshow is an anthology series uh, where all of the stories are good. Uh, seriously, all of them are good. Uh, you can pretty much start anywhere with Creepshow. Start with the TV series, it's a good choice. Start with the second one, it's a good choice. Start with the first one, it's a good choice. All of them are good choices. And I think that is mostly due to the fact that it has, first off, some really solid writing from some horror talent. And second off, the fact that it is one of the few horror movies that dares to, like, show stuff in color. A lot of horror requires, like, mood lighting and, like, darkness and black and white and, like, a real cool tone. So it's nice to see something that's, like, aggressively colorful. Probably because it's based on comic books. Um, but Creepshow is a fun, entertaining ride where all of the stories hold up. And I mean all of them hold up. And finally, if you are just a fan of horror movies in general, it's really fun to see a bunch of, like, great horror special effects and just horror icons in general. They show up in Creepshow all the time, mostly because it's an anthology series. So if you're looking for something with some traditional Halloween vibes to get your Halloween going further into the year, Creepshow. It's good. Anyways, let's talk about some honorable and dishonorable mentions. So, some honorable mentions. Um, I Married a Witch by Renee Claire is absolutely adorable and stars short person icon Veronica Lake. I say that because I'm a short person and we need more short people icons. Um, so Veronica Lake is really cute. She plays a witch. Uh, she falls in love and tries to get married to a boy. And I never get to talk about rom-coms on this channel because I'm obviously not a rom-com channel. <laughs> um, so it's really nice to talk about a Halloween rom-com. I Married a Witch is very, 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 very cute. And I very much like it. And it's like a cool, crisp, like, hour and 20 minutes. So this is a great one to watch with your girlfriend, if you got a girlfriend. Or lover, if you got a lover. <laughs> um, either way, I Married a Witch by Renee Claire. Now for the dishonorable one. It's time for Olala by Amy Hesketh. Um, if you have seen my Girl Behind the Counter Instagram, you're very familiar with this one. Um... So Olala is about a group of vampires in Bolivia and the story of the eponymous Olala. And it's the best way to describe it is uh, Bolivian S&M vampires. Do with that as you will. So it is honestly quite beautiful it is quite low budget as well and if you're into video art it's going to be something that you very much enjoy and it's also something from the video art like genre that like looks genuinely like really pretty and like really good and just like really holds up it's also available for about like five bucks on vimeo so like what's the trailer what have you got to lose I always gotta cover a Latino horror movie in this. Anyways, time for the last one. And finally, we're gonna end this series with Oz Perkins, The Black Coat's Daughter. And in case you didn't know, Oz Perkins is the son of Anthony Perkins, who did the stabby, stabby, stabby in Psycho. Um, there's your fun fact for this evening. Um, so... I can't really give you a summary for this one, mostly because it would ruin the whole movie, but I can tell you why I like it. It's one of the few films that, like, deals in an all-female cast of basically teenage to early 20s girls. Wow, I talk about teenage girls a lot on this channel. That's weird. Um... <laughs> But it's one of the few movies that talks about teenage girls and that only deals with teenage girls and mostly their relationship to other girls. And it's one of the few movies that talks about loneliness and women that have trouble making friends with other women. I think it's really interesting because it's one of the few films that talks about women who have trouble making friends and not to spoil anything but my 
favorite of all of the scenes and probably the most disturbing scene in my mind is when a character who was previously possessed comes back to the site of their possession and asks to be taken again. And the entity which possesses that person refuses and they're left alone. And it's typically not a not like a moment that's really cited in a lot of these Black Coat's Daughter Explains videos. Um, but it's incredibly central to the message of the film. So this is my final entry because it's one of the scariest movies on the list. And it's one that genuinely filled me with dread. Um, it has fantastic ambiance. It's got some great performances from the entirety of the cast. And finally, it's just one of the few movies that doesn't rely on like jump scares or like super disturbing scenes or cheap gags to get what it needs to say across. And this is coming from somebody who like watches this shit for fun. So I'm a little desensitized now. This film fucked me up. So if you are, if you want to see a movie that destroys you emotionally and makes you feel way too vulnerable, um, I am the Black Coat's daughter. <laughs> and you should watch the Black Coat's daughter. Anyways, I'm Bridget Bardot for all you know, your girl behind the counter. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments section. Like, comment, subscribe. And just to let you know, this video is evidence that I do read the comments. Um, anyways, I'll see you in the next video, Counter Crew.